Hey everybody and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast is brought to you by my sponsors, Goliath Technologies, who help IT pros be proactive and anticipate, troubleshoot, and prevent end-user experience issues, regardless of where IT workloads or users are located. And also by Liquidware, creators of FlexApp, the most feature-rich application learning product on the market. And now this week's news. VMware had a pretty big week. They released new versions of the VMware Horizon suite, including VMware App Volumes version 2.17, which features support for Windows 10 version 1903. Uh, App Volumes Manager can now communicate to SQL Server using TLS 1.2, which is becoming a major pushing point for enterprise IT security teams. They really want to get off of TLS 1 and 1.1. And also, probably the biggest feature or announcement for version 2.17 is AppVolume's API reference documentation is now available on VMware Code. Also receiving an update is VMware User Environment Manager, which releases as version 9.8.0. New features include uh, additional Horizon Smart policies, including for audio playback, drag and drop, and Blast Extreme protocols H.264, H.264 high color accuracy, H.264 minimum quality, HEVC, H.265, JPEG, and max frame rates. There's also additional options or choices for Blast PCYP endpoint platform conditions, including Chrome ARC++ and Chrome Native. There's also new regular expression support for conditions and additional Windows support for Windows 10 version 1903. Interestingly, if you were a maybe a Medio customer before VMware purchased it and you're considering whether or not you keep the product, it seems from this version on, semantic workspace virtualization has become deprecated. That's pretty obvious because semantic no longer actually supports that product anyway, but I do know just in the grand scheme of application virtualization products, there were some pretty large or medium-sized customers who are running that. So if that's you and you're using Emidio, then you need to know that. The Horizon suite itself, version 7.9, has quite a lot to unpack. So I'm not going to go through absolutely everything. But there's enhancements around the uh, actual VMware Horizon console itself, the ability to add, edit, or remove an instant clone domain administrator, the ability to configure smart card authentication, monitor published desktop and application sessions, configure event reporting and monitor events, view the number of published desktop sessions for farms or registered machines, publish and launch UWP applications, which is pretty interesting, configure the multi-session mode feature for published applications, View the image, pending image, and task columns for an RDS host for a farm, and more. Additionally, you'll be able to publish and launch UWP applications too, which maybe I'm just not up to date, but I don't think other vendors in this space are supporting UWP, at least not like a native integrated option for publishing them. For virtual desktops, when creating an instant clone, you can now select whether and when to refresh the OS disks. When creating an instant clone, you can determine whether to allow ESXi hosts to reclaim unused disk space on instant clones that are created in space-efficient disk format. The space reclamation feature reduces the total storage space required for instant clone desktops, which is pretty cool. There's also been some enhancements for the Horizon agent for Linux and just the regular Horizon agent for Windows. I'll share a link with this episode if you want to read about all of the new enhancements and features for yourself. Unfortunately, Cloudflare had a major outage this week again. Last week's wasn't directly related to Cloudflare, however. It was more around BGP and they were just collateral damage that happened to have a ripple effect for so many web services that rely on them. For this week's outage, however, Cloudflare are putting their hands up and admitting to fault, which is nice to see, frankly. 
There was a large CPU spike caused by a bad software deploy that was rolled back. Once rolled back, the service returned to normal operations and all domains using Cloudflare returned to normal traffic levels. Somebody jokingly tweeted, ouch, someone's going to get fired. Cloudflare CTO, John Graham Cumming, replied, quote, nope, that's not the way to think about this. A mistake happened and the fact that it was allowed to happen is an organizational issue, not an individual one. While sure, yep, it's not an individual issue, I wish the individual who will inev inevitably have to deploy the software again in a few weeks time the best of luck with the next attempt because I've been there before. Pascal Berger's MSIX Commander tool has now received an update. Version 1.0.5.4 is now available. The tool will help you easily sideload your apps and switch to Windows 10 developer mode. You're also able to open CMD, RegEdit, or Notepad inside your MSIX application of choice, and the tool itself is now also available as an MSIX package, which is pretty cool. That's now only the second uh, application delivered with MSIX that I'm aware of, so that's pretty cool. Microsoft's Chromium-based Edge browser, which is still in preview as of this recording, has just had a major new feature released. The Edge Canary channel now have a version of the browser that can be installed and run on Windows 7, Windows 8, and Windows 8.1. So if you want to try it on one of those older operating systems, give it a go. ZDNet have reported that an Israeli IT company called Attunity, who provide data warehousing, data management, and replication services to some of the largest organizations in the world, exposed some of its customers' data after it left three Amazon S3 buckets exposed on the internet without a password. The data was exposed for up to three days and included backups of employees' OneDrive accounts, email, system passwords, private keys for production systems, sales and marketing contact info, project specifications, and employees' personal data, plus more. Parent company of Tunity, Click, have stated that they are still in the process of conduct conducting an investigation and that the early indications are that the only external access of the data was by the security firm UpGuard, who are actually the ones who discovered the vulnerability and notified the company of it. On last week's episode of the podcast, I talked about the launch of the new Raspberry Pi 4. A quick word of caution, courtesy of Martin Rowan, it appears the really nice looking official Raspberry Pi case may not be fit for purpose. With the extra resources in this version of the device also comes a higher energy consumption, and by the description from Martin, the case does not have cooling capabilities and can see the device overheat. The specs are still damn impressive, you don't really need a case to run these, so if you have something appropriate to just keep it on without using the case, or if you're willing to just hold off and wait until there are other cases available, I'd say don't let this deter you. You can still go ahead and put down an order. Surprisingly, Microsoft announced that Office 365 Pro Plus will now support Windows Server 2019. You may recall a few months ago, around the time I covered the FSLogix acquisition, that it appeared Office 365 Pro Plus would not be supported on Server 2019 at all. It seemed at the time that Microsoft were trying to get very aggressive with pushing people who wanted Office 365 Pro Plus in a multi-user environment scenario to move to Windows Virtual Desktop. Funny enough, actually, over two weeks ago at the Irish Citrix user group, a Microsoft employee was there and stated that Office 365 Pro Plus is in fact supported on Server 2019, but there is a caveat. It is only supported until October 2025. I think this is not necessarily new information, it just wasn't stated clearly until this week. This is great for all of us though and gives us more time to adjust to the changes. Speaking of Office 365 and FSLogix, it's finally here. The official Microsoft Blessed version of FSLogix is now available for download with a proper license key for all customers. If you are not familiar with FSLogix, you need to try it. Most will want to look at the Profile Containers feature specifically as a profile solution, but personally, I also find a lot of value in the App Masking feature. 
So go out there and download it today. And while doing so, check out great new blog posts this week on FS Logics by Aaron Parker at stealthpuppy.com and James Rankin at james-rankin.com. There's some great startup information if you're just getting started with FS Logics on their sites, as well as useful tips and tricks you'll want to know. Citrix this week released the first ever reference architecture guide for remote PC, an underrated and often underutilized Citrix feature that allows you to publish users' physical desktops in storefront. This allows them to remote to their workstation when at home over HDX rather than RDP. This is useful for just getting access to their PC, but can also be useful for power users. If you have VDI, but have people who require much more spec or beefy desktops than you are comfortable provisioning in your VDI, this could be a good option. Also useful for admins who may want something persistent that they can install their own tools on, but access remotely from home. Windows Defender Application Control has had some pretty major enhancements rolled out as part of the May 2019 update. Microsoft state they took some long-standing feedback on manageability improvements on board with new capabilities including file path rules including optional runtime admin protection checks and this is, um, this is an option to check at runtime that apps and executables allowed based on file path rules must come from a file path that's only writable by administrators or higher privileged accounts. So it's kind of like a whitelist blacklist for file paths. Other capabilities include multiple policy file support with composability, application control CSP to provide a new richer MDM policy management capability, COM object registration support and policy, disabling script enforcement rule options, and more. Interestingly, it seems like this version is attempting to merge some of the app locker features or at least bridge some of that feature gap. A few weeks ago, I covered the release of Control Up version 7.4 and talked about what I feel is the killer new feature, the automation capabilities. Trent Tai published an excellent blog post showing some of the power of this new automation feature. He aptly titled it Faster Than Human, Augmented Troubleshooting. It covers an all too familiar scenario of a Citrix delivery controller that loses connection to the database intermittently. All Citrix components and the database itself seem to be in good health, which means you come to a dead end and Citrix support tell you they need traces from all machines in order to investigate further, but it's impossible to get those traces because the issue arises intermittently and maybe only for a few minutes at a time. Trent thought of a way to script it and have control up automatically gather the traces from all relevant servers when the issue arises. It's really excellent stuff. You'll want to read this for yourself. I'll share a link to that and everything I've referenced on this episode of the podcast on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links for episode 79. And to wrap up the news this week, I'd just like to wish a congratulations to all new and renewed Microsoft MVPs. And now the weekly webinars. I actually have two webinars this week that I'd quickly like to mention. First, Software 2 are doing a What's New webinar for version 2.7 of their great product, Apps Anywhere. It's going to be held on July 9th at 3.30 p.m. British Summer Time, which is 10.30 a.m. Eastern for the American audience. Trent Tai, who created that cool blog post on augmented troubleshooting that I mentioned earlier in this episode, will be hosting a webinar on troubleshooting and optimizing VDI user experience with ControlUp's new automated solution too. And that one's going to be held on July 10th at 6 p.m. BST, which would be 1 p.m. Eastern for the U.S. audience. And now scripts, tricks, and tips. There's a couple this week. First up, some really helpful tips on ergonomics for all of us IT workers out there who sit on our fat arses all day. I have had to cover this a few times at large companies in training, but the information shared by Manuel Rodero and University Politecnica de Catalonia is very nicely presented and amazingly comprehensive. You can see an example in the YouTube version of this episode if you're listening to the audio-only episode, and I will, of course, share links. 
to all this amazing content. This week I also saw a pretty cool script by Andreas Nick on GitHub. It's a really sweet WPF PowerShell script for outputting into beautiful chart views. So you probably know the default chart view output option in PowerShell is pretty much only good for easy reading within the console. It could be easier than reading like long strings that kind of just look like gibberish within the console. But this one actually just blows that away and is really great for putting in documents, just screenshotting and putting in emails or within IMs too. It's really super clear. I'm gonna hopefully use this myself for making some quick charts and diagrams for some of the data in my Citrix environment. So this is pretty cool. You wanna check this out. And that's it for another episode. Thank you all so much for listening.